Hello, and welcome to the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering, or IMSI, briefing paper launch on multi-scale modeling for batteries. This briefing paper was created alongside the Faraday Institution and can be downloaded via their website or through ours. You will find a link to the briefing paper in the chat function. To introduce, I'm Professor Gregory Offer, Professor in Electrochemical Engineering in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Imperial College London. Before we start our session, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping rules. Please put any questions you may have for our panel in the Q&A function at any time during the session. However, your questions won't be answered until the panel discussion itself. Please do not put questions in the chat function. If you have any technical difficulties, please message IMSI Imperial privately and a member of the IMSI team will try and help where possible. The Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering is one of Imperial College London's global institutes. It draws upon the strength of all four faculties to address some of the grand challenges facing the world today. The Institute's activities are focused on tackling problems where molecular innovation plays an important role. As such, IMSI was set up to bring together people from all disciplines and backgrounds to solve global challenges facing our world. We believe that to be at the forefront of solving these challenges, we need to draw upon people from all backgrounds. We have a great session planned for today. So I'll shortly be handing over to Dr. Jacqueline Edge, the Farad Institution Project Leader at Imperial College London, and Dr. Laura Lander, lecturer at King's College London in the Department of Engineering, who will present the briefing note. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Edge. Um, I work at Imperial College with Greg Offer. I'm just going to share my screen. Right, so as far as I know, it's working. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> Right. So just to give you a brief overview of what the content of this briefing paper is. Um, so it's titled The Value of Modeling for Battery Development and Use. Um, it comes out of the Faraday Institution Multiscale Modeling Project, um, but it's also been branded with the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering who supported the project throughout. Um, the idea was that we thought we felt that there were some misunderstandings around what modeling could be used for and, and what the real benefit was for using models for batteries. Um, and so we thought this briefing paper would be a nice summary um, explaining what all the benefits are. Okay, so not sure. right, it is working here. Okay, so very briefly, what, what is modeling? Um, essentially, it's a digital representation of a real world system. The idea is that you emulate the, the structure and the behavior of, of some complex system. You can track the dynamics and the interactions between the, the components of that system. And this then allows you to assess new designs, new um, configurations, um, different options, different conditions in which to, to operate the device. Um, it's widely used across many disciplines, for example, in medicine, in, in biology, engineering, in space, um, military applications, business, communications, and many others. Um, so wherever you have um, an expensive, uh, risky, or difficult um, option to actually do the real trial, um, it's better to use a model and much faster. And it helps us to understand and predict really complex systems. So basically, how do batteries work? Actually, I think I skipped a slide yesterday. <clears throat> So why do we actually need batteries and why do we need models of batteries? Batteries are used, um, well, we're very familiar with batteries used in personal gadgets, in medical technology, and now most widely known uh, energy storage for electric vehicles and grids. Um, and they are very good, important for enabling the green transition um, of our energy systems. However, batteries are not quite perfect. They're very, very good. Um, they have a lot of features which make them ideal for energies, for energy grids and electric vehicles. But there are improvements that we need. So we need to make them perform better. We need them to last longer. We want them to be safer and we want them to be more sustainable, among other factors. 
So models can help us to save time in, in developing new batteries and improving them. Um, so you don't have to build a physical prototype every time you change a design consideration. So that means that it's a lot um, less costly and less time consuming. You can identify what the optimal material would be and, and the structures that you need um, to, to make it perform better. You can predict battery performance or predict when it might fail, which can improve safety. Um, and design ways in which you'd operate the battery so that it, it performs its best. So basically, very briefly, how do batteries work? So they are electrochemical energy storage method. Um, there are electrochemical reactions, redox reactions that happen within the electrodes that release the electrons and the lithium ions from the lithium atoms. The electrons move in the external circuit, um, providing a current, um, and the lithium ions will travel across the electrolyte past the separator and through to the opposite electrode. Um, in discharge and charge, the, the exact opposite um, processes happen. So in discharge, the electrons and lithium ions are released in the negative electrode, and they pass through to the other side, to the positive electrode. Um, and in charge, it happens in the reverse direction. So that's a very simple picture, um, but there's a lot that we don't understand about batteries yet. So for example, what might actually slow down lithium ions passing from one electrode to the other? And that would affect the power of the battery. Why does the power and the energy of the battery fade as we use it? So over years of use, um, and particularly with, with heavy use, the batteries degrade. So why do they de degrade? Sometimes even just putting them on the shelf, they might degrade over time. Um, so we need to understand what the mechanisms are that cause that, which de de um, degradation mechanisms dominate and under which conditions they dominate. So what do we mean when we say multi-scale modeling? So there are many different length scales that you could consider within batteries. So you could zoom right in down to the atom level and try to understand the interactions between atoms and molecules. And this is basically called atomistic modeling. If we zoom up to micrometer scale, then we're looking at the structure of the electrodes and trying to understand how that structure can impede or improve the flow of lithium, ion, of lithium ions. Um, but then if we zoom out a bit, we might want to consider the whole design of the cell and how the, the, the shape of the cell and, and how we put the layers together might affect the performance of the cell. Zooming out further still, we want to consider how those cells work together to in, within a pack to perform to provide the energy and the power needed for a whole electric vehicle. Um, and then zooming out even more, you might want to look across the entire um, electric vehicle system. You want to look at the transport system or the grid system. How do batteries perform within that system so that we can make system level optimizations? But it's not just about length scale, it's also about time scale. So the time scales at which processes happen within batteries can be from microseconds or even shorter through to years if we're looking at the whole battery lifetime. So we need models that can address all these different scales from the point of view of length and time. <clears throat> so looking briefly at atomistic modeling. So what we're doing here is we're applying known physical and chemical principles to simulate the interactions between atoms and molecules. There's a quite a wide range of techniques within this category of modeling. So for example, there's molecular da dynamics, density functional theory. Um, they do actually have high predictive accuracy. So even though they are models, they're models based on what we know about physics and chemistry. And so they are very accurate. Um, and there've been many examples in the literature of theoretical predictions, which have then later been confirmed by experiment. So for example, um, there were many diffusion mechanisms which were predicted um, from the theory of graphite and lithium ions moving within graphite. Um, and then X-ray diffraction later on confirmed that these theories were correct. So atomistic model, they're very powerful, very accurate, and they're key to understanding why batteries degrade, um, which conditions accelerate degradation, and the factors which may limit battery performance. Um, within the, the Faraday Institution, we have the multi-scale modeling project. And within this, we have um, a section of atomistic modeling, which is done by Professor Sk Chris Skylaris, who's one of our panelists today. Um, and he's looking at extending the package called OneTEP, which is based on density functional theory. And that stands for Order N Electronic Total Energy Package. And this is a very, very powerful tool which can perform simulations on thousands of atoms within a matter of hours, as opposed to the earlier forms of, of density functional theory, which could take months to run. 
So OneTap has found a way to, to simplify those calculations and run them much faster. So harnessing, that means that we can harness the power of atomistic modeling. It's a lot closer to being harnessed within real time, but of course we're still quite a long way to actually running it within seconds. Um, so if you want to really understand what's happening within the battery, you need to be able to look at the atom interactions. And that means you have to track thousands and thousands of atoms. Um, so within a battery, we need to remember that they are very, very complex devices and there are many different materials and layers of materials with atoms working together. And so if you want to simulate all of that complexity, you would need to then include many tens of thousands of atoms and then simulate much larger sections of, of atoms. And using conventional um, atomistic modeling, that's very difficult to do. It, it would take you months to run a simulation. But with one type, we can do that within hours. <clears throat> so that's the, the atomistic side. Um, and this is the, so now we're zooming out. I'm, I'm going to skip the structure side. We're going to go to cell level modeling. So within cell-based modeling, if you, if you want to look at the, the function of the entire battery cell, there are essentially two categories within here. You either uh, look at equivalent circle, which is quite um, a simplified version um, where you, you're basically mimicking the electrical performance of the cell. So you would uh, imagine what the circuit would, would need to be to get the same performance and then uh, design that circuit and, and your model would, would um, basically assume that that circuit applies in the operation of that cell. Um, but it doesn't necessarily reflect what's actually happening within the cell. So it doesn't necessarily reflect diffusion of ions and atoms um, within the cell. Um, but it, they're very powerful uh, techniques and they can be very useful to understand the, the sort of the superficial behavior of the cell. Um, the, on the other side, there's physics-based models, which are like atomistic models. They're based on the fundamental principles that we know, but they're much more simplified models than atomistic models. And this is because, obviously, if you want to run such a, a huge device within a simulation, you can't possibly track every single atom and molecule. So we have these more simplified theories, um, which are based on what's actually happening within the cell. Um, so from these two aspects, you can you can get a nice picture of what's happening within the cell. In uh, the Faraday Institution Multiscale Modeling Project, uh, we have two uh, cell-based modeling tools, which are PyBAM and Dandelion. And on the side of the equivalent circuit models, um, we will be developing a, cool, a tool called PRISM, but that will be within the next couple of years. <clears throat> So now once you have a cell-based model which can accurately reflect the behavior of your cell, whatever the chemistry is within it, um, you can then expand that to, to model entire pack and try and understand how those cells work together. But then you'd also need to add in other elements of the pack, such as the thermal management um, and the battery management system and sort of external conditions. Um, and so when you're simulating the battery pack, you want to understand um, how there be temperature variation within that pack, which can then cause one cell to degrade faster than another. Um, and your battery management system needs to use that model of the pack to be able to say, well, um, given the conditions of the, the pack and all the cells within it now, what might happen if, uh, if we run this in, in half an hour or an hour or maybe a day? Um, is there a possibility of failure ahead, um, depending on how the, the pack is working now? So the battery management system needs those very accurate, um, very fast models to understand um, what might happen in the future. And that's the only way we can predict whether a battery failure might occur. Um, so these, these tools are very important. Um, to maintain safety of electric vehicles. Um, and then zooming out at the system-wide level, so now we're looking at much larger, larger systems, trying to understand what happens when we scale up to sort of widespread use of electric vehicles with batteries, um, trying to understand how fleets might work together, looking at supply chains across the whole life cycle of the battery. Um, and so it's taking a holistic approach to look at the system level um, considerations um, and optimizing at system level, uh, things like cost, sustainability, safety, et cetera. Um, so you may have heard of terms like techno-economics, which is where we relate the cost of a system to its performance. Um, and we can consider market risks of, of different types of technology. 
We can look at deployment strategies and what the infrastructure requirement might be. Um, we can look at life cycle assessment, which is what I look at, um, and that's considering sustainability impacts across the supply chain. We can also consider what the impact of a different policy might be or vice versa. We can consider what sort of policies you might want to develop um, in order to control the, the limitations of batteries. Um, for example, um, energy storage, which is now quite a popular concept, um, the importance of this and how to deploy it was identified using whole system model. So whole system modeling is very important for, for assessing those trade-offs of the, the costs and the benefits across the whole life cycle and at the scale of much larger systems. So I'm going to hand over now to Laura Lander, who's going to take it in, give you more of an example about whole systems models. Hi, Jacqueline. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as Jacqueline mentioned, um, it's important also to look at, at the battery, how it performs in a real-world context. And here, market scale analyses using techno-economic models and life cycle assessment, a very powerful tool to evaluate the economic and also environmental performance of a battery technology in the world, real world context. And one example of um, such analyses is a study we've published um, now two years ago, where we looked at the impact of a battery thermal management system on the battery lifetime and in turn on the life cycle cost and carbon footprint. So thermal management systems are an integral part of a battery pack as they ensure that the battery is in optimal um, temperature windows, so ensures battery safety, but also slows down battery degradation and thus increases the battery lifetime. So what we did um, based on experimental data and also modeling data, we were able to determine the um, battery lifetime of a variety of thermal management systems, including air cooling, as well as liquid cooling systems, um, such as tap cooling, surface cooling, and immersion cooling. And we then integrated this uh, battery lifetime in um, whole system models, techno-economic and life cycle assessment models. And we found that um, because liquid cooled battery systems usually have a longer lifetime than air cooled systems, also their life cycle cost and carbon footprint are lower. And this is due to the fact that the um, environmental and also economic impacts of the battery, so during the production, for example, are compensated by the extended lifetime of the battery. So overall, the, the cost and footprint are lower. So this is quite a nice example of um, how the combination of fundamental modeling and whole system models um, provides a more holistic view of the, of the real world impact of a new technology uh, of new developments in, in the battery realm. And also it's a really useful tool to, to guide future research where we can assess which kind of new developments and new directions, new research direction, directions make sense on the, on the larger scale. If you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So another message we want to convey with this, um, with this uh, briefing paper is also looking at the the uh, entire value chain. So what is really misleading is just doing snapshot analyses of the economic and environmental impacts of a battery. So for example, looking only at the materials processing as, um, as the true cost and environmental impact of a battery system can be only assessed when you look across the entire value chain, starting from materials uh, extraction uh, across the use phase, also to the various disposal strategies, including um, recycling uh, or second bag applications. So um, in general, techno-economic and life cycle assessments, um, assessment models are very useful to reveal trade-offs um, in terms of performance, environmental and economic impacts across technologies, and also help to identify an optimum um, solution in a specific application context. And here specific context is uh, underlined as a Every, every application requires different um, performance of a battery and also Im impacts the battery lifetime, the battery performance. Um, so it's very important that uh, each model is tailored to a specific application to ensure a realistic um, and accurate outcome of, of the models. Great, thank you, Laura. <clears throat> 
So just to tie back to the title of this talk, um, so the value of modeling, um, there's this value to many stakeholders. So within industry, um, they can use models to reduce development costs. Um, they can facilitate rapid advances in batteries, reduce the manufacturing costs of batteries, um, and provide uh, cheaper and more secure warranties for those batteries. Um, for policymakers, they can use models to, it, to scale up their calculations and understand sort of system-wide impacts. Um, it can facilitate decisions around system-wide um, considerations such as sustainability, which is not just related to one small area, but covers the entire system. Um, the cost of the whole system, cost of uh, total cost of ownership, for example. Um, and also you can consider safety across the entire supply chain. Um, for researchers, obviously models are very important to understand the internal processes of the battery um, and to explore a wide range of options that we could deploy to try and improve batteries and also to make some sense of uh, the incredible complexity of batteries. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Laura, for an overview of the report and the work that went into it. Um, Hopefully many of you listening have already read it or um, have opened the link and are reading it as we present. Uh, we now have a panel um, which includes both Jacqueline and Laura um, who've already been introduced and then we also have uh, Dr Damico Widenlarge um, who's the system professor at University of Warwick in the machine learning group. Uh, we have uh, Nigel Taylor who is founder of batterydesign.net um, and previously worked for many years in Jaguar Land Rover. And we have Dr. Laura Lander, uh, sorry, no, I've already introduced that. We have Professor Chris Crichton Scalaris, who's Professor of Computational Chemistry at the University of Southampton. Uh, the uh, question and answer session is now open. So if people may want, have any comments or questions that they would like to ask, um, please put that in. I will monitor it and I will introduce them into the panel discussion at an appropriate point. In the meantime, we have five uh, pre-prepared questions that we ask the panelists um, to consider uh, to kickstart the discussion. I will ask each of the panelists one of those five questions to get things going um, and hopefully uh, be able to weave in any additional questions as they are received. So those five discussion, discussion. points um, yeah, are sorry. firstly, how close are we to digital twins? Uh, secondly, how can the different modeling scales work together? Thirdly, uh -huh. um, what kind of experiments do we need to validate models? Um, fourthly, what are the limits of models and the limits of experiments? And fifthly, um, why are physics-based models not more widely used in industry? So if we open that up, um, maybe if I just start by asking Damika, um, how close do you think we are to digital twins? Thanks, Greg. Hi, everyone. Um, I think... Uh... In my view, we're just getting started with the digital twins, I think, uh, and it's it's uh, quite a long, quite a bit more way to go before we it gets established. Is is uh, my views, and the reason I think the reason I say that is uh, for digital twins to really work, there are quite a few bits that need to come together. So it's not just the models; we need advanced BMSs um, and cloud computing technology and the communications between those to be set up for the digital twin to work successfully so i think you know all the elements are there it's just um putting them together effectively and getting them working is it's just kicking off in my view and i think that's it's going to be interesting because uh, you know we've had fairly we have complex models running on our desktops uh we you know the bms technology is coming up uh so i think it's going to be an interesting space how they start to communicate and get the information across. I mean, there are some interesting academic technical questions in between, but also I think the infrastructure is just coming together uh, in my view. Uh, so yeah, I think there's, we just keep getting getting started, I think. Okay, would any of the other panelists like to comment on how close we are to digital twins? I just want to say that, I mean, I fully agree with what Damika is saying, but uh, um, also the, the digital twins, as I understand it, a digital twin is something that would be, for example, in a, a electric car and it would in real time uh, assess and, and make decisions, right? Of, of, of how, the, um, how the battery should be treated. So um, 
So I think uh, the um, performance, I mean, things happening fast and in real time is very important for this to happen in reality. Okay, we have a, um, a couple of questions already in the Q&A. So really interesting presentation, thanks. Clearly there are many advantages to the modeling techniques that you presented. How widely adopted are these models in industrial development currently? And what do you think the bottlenecks are to wider update? Um, Nigel, perhaps you could kickstart a response yeah. to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's interesting. There's a, there's a lot of, you know, the models on, on different scales. And I think it comes back to your, um, you know, your physical length scale versus your time scale. And it's interesting to compare that and see where industry would sit on those types of scale. Um, the models tend to be the equivalent circuit models. They tend to be models that are easy to parameterize. The data is readily available from existing experiments that the industry might do to extract other parameters. So they tend to be, because their industry tend to be stuck in their ways, you know, they don't really want to add in more tests unless they really have to, unless they can really show the, valid, the validity of it. Um, and if you've been one of those poor modeling guys, you know, in industry, you'll realize that you're probably last to the to the trough for data. So um, you tend to get fed what, what's, what's happening. But I mean, equivalent circuit models with a coupled thermal model, they run very fast. You can parameterize them very quickly. Um, and you can understand how a cell is behaving with its cooling system and with the other cells. And you can understand how the complete pack's behaving. And also you can even run those models in the full system. So you can get the, the bang for the buck is really high. You know, the, the, the cost to make it the, and, the, and the rate at which you can deploy it is extremely like a, like a sweet spot, I think. So that's, that's my view on why they use so heavily and they tend to concentrate around there. So, so is that an answer to the question of why are physics-based models not more widely used or, or would you be able to comment on that as well? Uh, yeah, I mean the physics, the physics-based models. When I when I've looked at them, and I'm I'm probably a bit, uh, you know, just I, it probably needs a bit more of a chat with you on where we are currently with all of the parameters. But a lot of those parameters, you need to be really close to the cell uh, design or the cell, you know, um, the company that's making the cell, because some of those parameters in terms of you know particle size, you just can't readily get some of that data, yeah? And, and you really need to be the person who's put that cell together. Um, that, that said, you know, and that, that, that means that if you're not one of the really big companies tied into one of the big cell manufacturers, your likelihood of getting that data is probably quite slim. So you're gonna be estimating it off other measurements. So I think there's a little bit of reluctance to do that because of that cost of that difficulty and the cost of it. And the cost of, I think, it comes back to Chris's thing. If, if you know the cost, the computational cost is very high. Therefore, you'll back away a bit from it, and you'll use something that that, that gets you eighty percent of the answer much quicker. And it and it is that eighty twenty. You know, if I can get eighty percent of the answer in a, a tenth of the, of the time, I'll go that route because I can run more parameters, I can try more things, I can run case studies on it. Yeah. And any other panelists like to add to this thread? If, if I may, I think, um, in my view, with models in industry, I think what industry are looking for, they want the models to answer a certain problem. So, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean we need the, the world's most complex model for that. If there's a model, a simple enough model that answers the question, excellent. So why put the extra effort to make a more, you know, I think unnecessarily complex. So there's a, there's a, I think there's, and with the physics based model, that's sometimes the case because the ECMs have done a great job, equivalent circuit model. There's a bit of reluctance saying, well, why do we need these models when we already have one in place? And that's a that's a very relevant question in my view, right? The models, you know, all models should have a purpose. They're not there just for the sake of simulating. They have to really answer some useful questions. And if if industry have models that are already answering their, their questions or the problems very well, then stick with it, right? There's no real need to go for more advanced models. And I think from academia, there's uh, for us to make a case for physics with models, demonstrating the benefit. Uh, and in my view, there are certainly are some areas where you know we can demonstrate the benefit of the aging and this longer term dynamics. Uh, but then there's a question of 
it goes back fine. How do we get the experiments? How do we get these models working for our commercial cells? And then there's you know some additional questions afterwards. So I think in my view that that's some of the challenges I see that industry already have simple models and models have to be simple in my view and they work if they work fantastic and then there's a case to be made why do we want to bring all this additional complexity for what you know what's the benefit of it so there, there is something I want to add here uh, so the the more complex models or the more physics based models um, are needed because of their transferability because uh, a lot of the simpler models, the simple models uh, are often not transferable. They might work only for lithium ion chemistry batteries, but if you go to a new chemistry, uh, the parameters, the, the type of model is, is just not applicable. Um, or, it, or even if it does work, it works for the wrong reasons. And, and then if you go a bit outside the, the area of applicability, it completely breaks down in an unpredictable way. Uh, so the um, the more accurate physical theory, starting from the atomistic going upwards, uh, have the advantage that uh, they work for the right reasons and they are transferable. They, uh, you can use them on, on, on any kind of chemistry, any kind of uh, uh, new materials. Uh, and that's a big advantage when you want to, I mean, as the next question says, you want to do uh, revolutionary development, go to something brand new rather than evolving something that you already have. Uh, so that's the advantage of the, the detailed physics-based models. Yeah, so um, thank you, Chris, for giving me a nice link to uh, one of the questions in the Q&A. Um, so actually, if um, so an another question, what do you think are the opportunities for disruptive battery technologies in the next five to 10 years? or is development likely to be more evolutionary rather than revolutionary? Now, I imagine all the panel members might have a view on this. So maybe if I could ask Laura to respond first. Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, in my own opinion, I think, so the developments in terms of lithium ion batteries will be more evolutionary. I think they're quite deeply researched already and I'm not sure if there will be any revolutionary developments, for example, from a materials point of view, because for example, LFP or all the layered oxides we're using right now, they've been developed like 20, 30 years ago already. And they're just being, you know, there are only small step changes in terms of uh, performance improvements. And I believe that for lithium ion batteries, at least the highest improvements will come from uh, engineering, for example, cell engineering, pack engineering, and also gaining a deeper understanding of, for example, degradation mechanisms and how can we, um, prevent those and, and make batteries you know, last longer, be more sustainable in the sense, maybe cheaper. But obviously there's a lot of research going on also in new battery technologies. We have sodium ion batteries, we have multivalent batteries, and um, I guess we'll see uh, what they bring. And obviously also solid state batteries, which are being yeah, praised for quite a while, although I'm not sure they haven't been, there hasn't been much comm commercialization so far. So we'll see, I guess. Would anyone else like to follow up on this thread? Uh, can I just, I mean, I think one of the most disruptive things in the last couple of years has actually been the cell to pack, you know, and actually going back in technology and going, well, actually, um, and it comes back to the Laura's thing of packaging. You know, a lot of the gains are in packaging. If we can throw away a lot of the parts, because we've got, you know, we're only getting to about 60% of the, the cells capability at pack level. Um, so we've got a lot of weight we add. We've got to add a lot of cost and we add a lot of volume. That whole thing of going, well, if we go LFP, we can throw the module away. We don't have to have quite so much in there in front of the cell and, you know, thermal propagation material and all of that sort of thing, um, and we can handle the cell sort of in the terms of uh, pressure, et cetera, then actually that's quite interesting. And that, that's in industry, that's been very disruptive because it's brought back a technology that everybody thought had had its day, as, especially in, in, in electric vehicles. Um, so I think there's some exciting times. And I think sodium is possibly going to go same, the same way, which will be interesting. Yeah, it opens up other opportunities. Great. Thank you, Nigel. Um, so actually, um, I'll, I'll ask one of the other questions, one of the discussion points that we had that I think will address one of the outstanding questions as well. 
Um, so the link between experiment and modeling, um, you know, we had a discussion point of what kind of experiments do we need to validate models? Are they different from experiments used to learn about and understand the physics? And then we have a question in the Q&A, could you please say a little more about how you validated your multi-scale modeling work thus far, especially given the long time required to gather cell data and the variety of chemistries and subtle variations in batteries from processing variations. Jacqueline, perhaps you could start answering this question. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, so within multi-scale modeling project, we have a large number of experimentalists <clears throat> and they do this validation and they tailor that to those experiments to, to the actual models that we're investigating. Um, you have to do that because you want to make sure you're tracking the right set of parameters so that you can confirm all aspects of the model. Um, and you have to do those experiments under very rigorous um, conditions so that you know that it's that's only temperature or only humidity or whatever else you're looking at that that is affecting the battery in this way. Um, and <clears throat> so we've developed protocols um, to be able to do these experiments in a standardized way. Um, and you're right, it takes a very long time to sort of particularly look at battery degradation because you have to degrade the battery. Um, and that can take um, weeks, months, up to years, potentially. So we are running um, concurrent uh, sets of experiments on cells. We have one design and then a range of chemistries uh, done in that same design so that we can at least, we know that we can compare the different experiments. And we're running those experiments concurrently under different conditions um, to understand what the different degradation mechanisms, which ones dominate, um, that kind of thing. So, and, and which ones are, are most um, relevant for certain chemistries. So we have, we have quite a, a large branch of experimentalists within the project. Great. Would anyone else like to add on that? I mean, I think Nigel and Damika both mentioned experimental validation as well um, in some of their comments to the previous discussion points and answers. Um, so there's another good question. So there's another discussion point we haven't really gone into, um, which is how can the different modeling scales work together? And then we have another question. Uh, to what extent are microstructure resolved models used today in industry and what role will they play in the future for battery development? Are they just added complexity or do they add important value over homogeneous physics-based equivalent circuit models? So perhaps if we also extend, if I add to that question, well, how much are atomistic uh, models used today in industry, then Chris, you could perhaps answer this question. Yes. Um, so, Atomistic models are used in industry, um, but I guess it's historical because uh, atomistic models are not used as much as they should be used because historically uh, the industry doesn't have or didn't have access to enough supercomputing resources. In these days, uh, I think even industry has access to uh, either sufficient cloud computing or, or some local clusters that are sufficient to do some uh, quite significant calculations. So, um, so they are used in industry, but they could be used much more. Uh, it's also a matter of training that uh, they require some, some training, some knowledge that uh, some people, I mean, I know companies, I'm not going to mention names, but I know companies. But, uh, small teams of atomistic modelers uh, that that do quite good job with atomistic models. So um, I think they are catching up and they're using them more and more. Uh, and especially the developments we are doing uh, in Wanted in this uh, in multi-scale modeling project of the Fard Institution, uh, which are very important for commercially to industry. So um, so I think the it's it's a very it's an area which is growing uh, quite rapidly and, and uh, um, recognizing the value of atomistic modeling uh, or understanding um, uh, crucial effects such as the degradation of known chemistry such as lithium, which you will need to go to the atomistic details to understand it, uh, and also new, new chemistries that you cannot um, understand with you know high level very crude models um, also another thing that is becoming more understood and we could understand we could discuss a bit uh, maybe in a few minutes is how you connect the scales i think this is one of the the next questions and i can say a few things there as well that maybe we could 
Uh, mm -hmm. Please, please do carry, carry right. on, Chris. So, um, because we live in a multi-scale world, um, microscopic world, but you know we are made of molecules, macromolecules, and atoms. Uh, and in reality, all of these things, all of these scales, which are <clears throat> you know ten orders of magnitude in, in time and in, in length, at least in, in the world we live in, not not talking about. at the same time, right? But instantaneously, and actually the atomistic processes are so much faster than the, the macroscopic process. But when you do modeling, it's the other way around. The, the atomistic detail, and you, know, you have to use theories such as quantum theory or, or, or even classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, uh, in, in a very detailed way, in a very computationally uh, intensive way. Uh, so, and, and even with the developments we're doing in one step, we are, you know, speeding up the length and time scale, but we can never make them as fast as the macroscopic world. So, uh, I think the, the art of joining the scales is, is the art of extracting the appropriate parameters from each scale and uh, feeding them into the next scale and, and, and working with that model and that kind of retaining the crucial information that you need uh, the previous scale, you need to derive it from the previous scale. Uh, so this is the uh, philosophy that we uh, are following in the, in the multi-scale modeling project. Uh, it's, it's essential to, to link the scale, but you need to link them in a way, in a sense. You cannot uh, having a model that all the scales are simulated at the same in real time, if you like. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, so actually, one of the Q&A is, is a nice follow up from this thread. So a question, you mentioned some really nice tools for modeling on both atomistic and cell levels. So one tap, pi band, dandelion. Question is, are there plans to release similar tools for pack or system level modeling? Jacqueline, perhaps you could comment. Yep, I was actually just typing an answer to that. Um, so yes, we are planning to do similar tools um, for both of those scales, for pack level and um, for system-wide levels. Um, and we want to make them sort of consistent um, and as extensible and open source as PyBAM particularly is, um, so that we can harness the power of, of development from, soft, from modelers and software engineers around the world. Um, and so I think uh, we've already started some work on pack level models actually using PyBAM models, um, and that, that will be released in the next year or so. Um, and then the systems level models we're developing over the next couple of years, um, we hope to release as, as industry usable tools. Great, thank you. And um, we have another question. Um, Okay, so we resolved that one and that one. The battery technologies are really evolving fast, while detailed physics modeling needs time to develop and perform good validations. Um, so, more, so this is a comment, a question, a couple of comments. Moreover, the dynamics of the battery dominates its overall characteristics. So the question is therefore, is the future, should the future focus be fully data driven, machine learning or black box um, or something else? Thank you. Uh, would any panelists like to jump in and comment on that question? So this is machine learning data driven approaches versus more understanding driven or physics based models. But perhaps I could uh, give a initial um, thoughts on that. I think it's a very interesting question. And uh, I've also been thinking about general trends. I think with uh, <laughs> So in, in my view, we are, we are just about getting more and more data sets on uh, batteries and really the, the gap that I see is on battery aging. There's a, there's a gap of accessibility for aging data sets, high quality aging data sets. And the challenge is it's not because it's not there, it's just that they, are not, they can't be shared equally around. So there's, you know, there's a, unfortunately the challenge of building open tools, open access tools for black box machine learning type activity needs high quality data. I'm not talking about the short length scales, but large length scales. So with that being a, a bit of a bottleneck, um, 
I don't see it being the uh, that you know the, the future trend will be entirely black box. Uh, but having said that, ideally, if we do, you know, batteries can only behave in a certain manner, right? This, it, it can't have all the behaviors. It you know, there's only a limited number of behaviors and dynamics it can display. So in principle, we should be able to test all these behaviors and have a rich data set uh, openly available. If that's possible, then yes, a black box approach is very likely. And you know, other domains have done this successfully um, uh, and batteries is no exception. Um, but in the mean, but I also think we also we, we have a lot of understanding of batteries at the moment. We know of you know a great wealth of information how they behave. And I think, you know, having a mix of physics and black box is what's going to take hold and going to be more of the norm. And really, it's to do with trying to predict the long-term effects. With aging coming in, more and more questions around how long the battery is going to last. At the moment, data-driven methods seem to work very well, but I think the generalizability is a bit what Chris also mentioned earlier is very limited. And I think there coupling physics and black uh, box ideas is going to really come out over the next couple of years. Um, so I think, um, in my view, it's, it's not going to be entirely black box for these practical reasons of not having a rich data set openly available. Uh, and so it's going to be a really a mix, I think, of physics based and uh, purely data driven or machine learning type. I think it's going to, even in industry and academia, it's going to, going to take hold, in my view. Yeah, I, 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 I'm resisting commenting on any of the questions. <laughs> I'll chip in on this one, uh, which which will will be the penultimate question. Yeah, I, I, I agree that hybrid approach is 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 almost certainly going to be the one that's that's adopted by industry. I mean, Nigel's comment from earlier about industry is going to do what they can trust and things that give them, you know, that fulfill the 80-20 rule, give them 80% of the answer, 20% of the effort. Um, and I think this this merging of the two, it, it actually led me to think, well, what should our research be focusing on? Um, and, and particularly the Faraday Institution Multiscale Modeling Project. I mean, what do we in academia do best and what does industry do best? Mm -hmm. what industry does best at making those efficiency decisions about how do they get the best answer for the lowest cost or the or the the best balance between accuracy of answer that they can make money from versus cost. Um, in academia, we don't have that same restriction. So we can push the boundaries of the physics and the understanding because that's what we're being paid to do. Um, and we don't have to make that cost benefit analysis per se. Um, so we should be pushing the boundaries of what's possible um, and industry should be pushing the boundaries of what's affordable. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we have one uh, final question, um, which we will make the last in the interest of time. So. Uh, some comments first. Um, the multiscale models um, orientated to look at electrochemical behavior for an ideal combination of the materials used to build the cells, or can the models be used to simulate processes such as drying and calendaring, uh, which would lead to real value for manufacturing? Uh, so would any of the panelists like to jump in and comment on yep. this? I can take that one. Um, so we have specifically developed models to understand some manufacturing processes. Um, we have published some papers on calendaring models um, and there's work underway on slurry drying. Um, and yes, we agree that, that models for, for manu manufacturing processes will be very valuable, um, but they don't really fit um, within the multiscale modeling tools that we have at the moment. So they're all standalone models. Um, so yeah, that's what we've been doing. I would say that moving forward, there is a new theme in multiscale modeling in the extension, um, which will be looking at formation. Um, so that is an important step in the manufacturing and assembly of a lithium ion battery. It costs a lot of money and improvements in that area could have a significant, uh, could make a significant difference. Um, so thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, everybody, um, for participating, the attendees for posting interesting questions for us to answer um, and listening to us. Um, thank you very much to Chris Craton Scalaris, Damika Widenlarge, uh, Nigel Taylor, Jacqueline Edge, and Laura Lander for taking part in the panel discussion today. Uh, thank you also to the IMSI team and the Friday Institution. Um, for helping uh, set up this event and providing funding for the work um, and the other authors who did not present today, uh, particularly Kieran Brophy and Alistair Hales, 
who couldn't be with us. Um, thank you to everyone who has attended online and please do not forget to read the briefing paper if you haven't already. Uh, you can find a link in the chat now.